guys, welcome back to Book and Spade, a uh, channel where we discuss all things biblical and patristic. I'm here with Dr. Lydia McGrew, author of The Mirror and the Mask. And today we're going to have an interview about her and her work, uh, particularly on The Mirror and the Mask, and just some uh, sneak peeks at uh, her work on the Johannine Corpus. So, Professor McGrew, I thought uh, before we begin, if you could just introduce yourself a little bit to our viewers and our guests as your work has been deeply influential, along with that of uh, Dr. Tim McGrew, your husband, in defending the uh, reportage model of scripture. John, thank you so much for having me. I, um, I am a philosopher. My husband, Timothy McGrew, teaches philosophy at Western Michigan University. I have uh, an extensive publication record in uh, analytic philosophy, including the philosophy of religion. And I have also written quite a bit on the philosophy of testimony and evaluating uh, what's called epistemology, the theory of knowledge in relation to the philosophy of testimony and how um, how we can know that testimony is true. So these topics are really relevant to um, the Gospels and evaluating the Gospels. And uh, Tim and I have been writing in apologetic related fields since about 2006 or so. And then in recent years, I've begun publishing professional articles just on probability theory and testimony. And, and I've been linking that with my work on the Gospels, even when I publish them separately and publish secular articles. And then I've begun publishing in 2017 a book called Hidden in Plain View, Undesigned Coincidences in the Gospels and Acts, where I uh, defended the Gospels' reliability. So there's a real overlap between my professional work and uh, in philosophy and my professional work now in the field of New Testament studies as well. Yes, I, I wish more New Testament scholars had a background in philosophy. I, I think it's critical to understanding the weightiness and seriousness of the matter, that it merely isn't um, working on the grammar, there are massive decisions that need to be made about the implications of a theory and whether it's probable or not. I think that dovetails beautifully into, you know, the purpose of the mirror and the mask, liberating the gospels from, uh, you know, literary device theory. Now, what's unique, before I came across a lot of your interviews about this on, you know, Apologetics Academy Forum and, and in other places, um, I'd always heard of literary device theory being used positively before, mostly because of introductions to more popular works by Lee Strobel or because of other academic research. And yet I think what you illustrate quite beautifully is um, perhaps a kind of challenge or perhaps a, a, a deep problem that's been introduced into the field by uh, some well-intended scholars. So I thought if you could just introduce uh, the title once again, the reasoning behind the mirror and the mask, and what you mean by literary device theory as well, to clarify for our viewers. Yeah, and that, that's really important. So the title is The Mirror or the Mask, Liberating the Gospels from Literary Devices. So my idea is that we have two options that we're being presented with for how to view the Gospels. We can view them as a mirror where we have a natural process of, um, a natural process of testimony that reflects the character of Jesus, the way that a natural process of light rays reflect a person's image in a mirror. Or we can have a mask where the author's agenda, the agenda of, say, John or Matthew, comes down in front of Jesus' face or between the reader and Jesus so that the reader always has to be a little bit dubious or be asking questions, have a kind of suspicion of the factual accuracy and say, well, maybe that was added or changed in order to reflect the author's theological agenda. Now, when I talk about literary devices, Obviously, I wasn't going to put everything into the title. You know, I put into the book what kind of literary devices I'm opposed to. I'm certainly not objecting to what you might just call a simple uh, verbal figure of speech. So, for example, if the Gospel of John says Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, it's pretty obvious that Pilate did not personally wield the whip. Just as if I said, I'm building a house. Uh, in my town, I am, you know, 
less than five feet tall, no one would think that I am personally wielding the hammer and building the house. They would know that what I mean by that is that I'm hiring a, a contractor to build the house. So those kinds of figures of speech could be thought of as literary devices, and I'm not objecting to those at all. Those are fully understood by anyone who speaks the language, any mature individual who speaks the language. But I'm talking about what I call fictionalizing or fact-changing literary devices. These arise when an author, or if, if they ever arise, if an author does them, the theory is that the author uh, writes in a way that appears historical, but that he's actually changed the facts in an invisible way. So the only way that his readers could ever figure it out would be if they compared it to something else. A good analogy would be what we get in a, a biopic, a movie. So we go to a movie and maybe it portrays something is happening in the year 1964, but if you go and you, you research the actual events, they actually occurred in the year 1969. And, but in the movie, you can't tell that because it's very realistically portrayed. Those are the kinds of literary devices that I think we do not find in the Gospels and that I'm, I'm uh, disagreeing with and wanting to liberate the Gospels from. Yeah, one of the interesting points, which um, I think you may have mentioned in, in some other article in First Things or in another magazine, was the idea, if you look at the Gospel of John chapter 12, it says Jesus went and found a donkey. Whereas, of course, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, you have him setting up, you know, John and Peter. But in either case, it, it essentially means that Christ found a literal donkey to sit on. You know, the, the agency doesn't necessarily matter there. But if you're switching or inventing entire scenes, as some literary device critics, Michael Lacona, uh, among them perhaps most prominently, uh, then it becomes a question of deep historical importance. Did Jesus really say, I thirst on the cross? Or was the term, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me, the first verse of the psalm taken out of context and later on adapted by the Johannine author, uh, who we hold to be, of course, John of Zebedee. But my, my question with all that is about that reportage model. Um, you've done a lot of work in the past with Hidden in Plain View as to the accuracy of the reportage model. If you could explain um, in more detail how we might distinguish the reportage model from, for example, the traditional view of biblical inerrancy on one hand, and then of course the, uh, the view that we often get, as you've just articulated, of the Gospels as some kind of um, filtered portrayal in the mind of a community or of an author who is simply trying to uh, wield the facts like a very loosely fitted movie. Right. So, and it's interesting you should say that, you know, distinguish it from inerrancy on the one hand and from the literary device view on the other. The way I would look at it, I would consider uh, traditional inerrancy. So I'm thinking of the, the inerrancy view of someone like uh, Dr. Geisler or the original authors of the Chicago Statement or something like that as being a subset or a subcategory of the reportage model. That is to say they're uh, completely compatible, you know, but it's, yeah. it, so, you know, we've got a kind of a one-way entailment. Being an inerrantist of the old school definitely is going to mean that you hold to the reportage model. Holding the reportage model is not going to automatically entail that you hold to old school inerrancy. Um, so you could hold that the Gospels authors are very close to the facts, that they're highly reliable, and that they never intentionally change the facts while still thinking that they occasionally make a small error. But at the same time, if you think that they never made any historical error, you're certainly going to think that they never intentionally changed the facts. So this is one reason why I found that what I call old style inerrantists um, are very friendly. To, to my views, and they appreciate the fact that even though I will say I do not consider myself an inerrantist, I'm very forthright about that, and then that we have a lot in common because we never think that the authors deliberately change the facts. So I, I give several characteristics of the reportage model. The authors were close to the facts, so they had opportunity to know what happened. Luke, for example, was not an eyewitness of Jesus' ministry, but he would have um, been able to talk with eyewitnesses. So that's only that's only one remove. That's not a long, like a telephone game, like what 
Bart Ehrman, the skeptical scholar, will say. Um, so they had an opportunity to know what was true. They never uh, deliberately changed the facts. They, when they reported what someone said, they reported it at, um, as at least a close and very recognizable paraphrase of something that occurred on that occasion, not moving something from a different occasion, putting it into a different setting. Um, and, and this is true, these things are true even of details. So those are some of the characteristics. And then that they are very successful. They're very successful. They're trying to get it right. And they do get it right. We find over and over again that they get it right, again, even on small matters of detail. Those would be some characteristics of the reportage model in, in distinction from these uh, somewhat looser literary device models. And, and I, I'm glad that, you know, at least old style narratists, uh, it's taken a long time for me to come to the position, but, but I have, um, are, are deeply able to use your work to defend the reportage model. Because most people, when they get introduced to the Gospels on an academic platform, if they didn't necessarily grow up with the New Testament, they're instantly given these radical late dates for the text. But as you've illustrated, you know, the, at least the belief that at least the synoptics predate AD 70 is widely possible given, and I would say highly probable, given some of the patristic evidence. I was wondering if you could eliminate some of your work about the probability theory that you've done in the past. Um, how does that help in terms of defending the accuracy of the reportage of the New Testament? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Well, a, a couple of things. One thing that I find myself bringing up again and again is the concept of simplicity. Um, and the concept of ad hocness and simplicity and ad hocness are very tightly bound up together. Um, so I'll, I'll just give an example here. One theory in, um, in Johannine studies is that John deliberately changed not only the day of Jesus' crucifixion, but also the time. Now, there is an apparent discrepancy between John and Mark concerning the time, um, where John says that Jesus was condemned by Pilate at the sixth hour, uh, which you would think would be noon, and then Mark says that he was crucified at the third hour. So, and of course, that event of his actually being put on the cross, it's even later, but Mark is giving an even earlier number. Now, my own preferred solution of this is that it, there is a scribal error in a, um, and we don't have a text that shows this, but I think it's a very economical theory. I think it's a very simple theory because if they were using an abbreviation, uh, then the, the gamma and the digamma for, um, the, the sixth and the third hour, just a single stroke of the pen would make a difference. And just a small scribal error could account for this. That's my preferred theory. Even some conservative scholars would instead say that each of them is what we might call rounding to the nearest three hour block, but they're rounding in opposite directions. So that's another theory. But uh, the theory of Dr. Lacona is that John changed it for theological reasons to associate uh, Jesus' death with the uh, slaughter of the lambs in the temple. Well, there are all kinds of problems with this, beginning with the fact that you cannot slaughter that many lambs all at, at one time. So it would be over a period of time. Also, there's no evidence that they were slaughtered at noon. They would have been slaughtered uh, it looks like, insofar as we have any evidence, beginning more in the afternoon. Um, there are all kinds of problems. John's Gentile readers wouldn't have recognized anything that subtle anyway. So this is a tremendously complex theory. And now as an example of ad hocness in Dr. Craig Keener's um, commentary on the Gospel of John, he actually recognizes some of the problems and admits some of them with the idea that John moved it to allude to the death of the Passover lambs. So then he says, but John's readers would recognize that it was at the sixth hour, at the heat of the day, that Jesus was weary in John 4 when he met the woman at the well. So, I, I mean, that's just, that's amazing that you would admit the problem with the most popular theological theory, and then you would just sort of drop that and go to some completely different symbolism as if John's readers would say, 
oh boy, he mentions the sixth hour back in John 4. I bet this is connecting it with Jesus' humanity and that he was weary. And so there's a complete failure to recognize the improbability of such theories because we're multiplying improbability upon improbability. And then when there's a problem, instead of just saying, you know what, maybe John didn't change this at all, we go out and we go in search of a different theological symbolism. So that would just be one of many examples of how my work in probability theory is relevant here. Now, this is sort of off the top of my head, but I'm wondering if probability theory would actually have a lot of work in union with uh, a discussion about a station, which we could dovetail into. But if you look at the Kenosis hymn of Philippians 2, though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not think equality with God something to be exploited, or, you know, Colossians 1, it, you know, we at least have good scholarship via N.T. Wright and, and through others suggesting a very early date for some of these creedal hymns. The thing is, had the I am statements as uh, at least I feel like my, my doppelganger in terms of the exact opposite opinion, uh, Craig Evans suggests and those others, if they didn't necessarily occur, if they didn't actually happen, it's very hard for me to move from some of the cryptic statements in the synoptics to those really early creedal hymns. I was wondering whether in regards to a probability theory, uh, if you look at the living memory of the, the eyewitness behind the Gospel of John and the eyewitnesses that certainly must have been alive even as late as AD 90, uh, whether there is some cogency to that argument. And in addition, I was wondering if you could also shed some light on why, first, what is the theory of multiple attestation? And then secondly, whether uh, or not it is necessarily a good way to examine the reliability of events in the Gospels. Okay, so, you know, probability theory applies to everything. You know, I, th I think it was Bishop Butler who said probability is indeed the very guide of life, but it might have been, might have been someone else. But it's, it, you know, we're going to be applying tacitly our notions of probability to all of these uh, questions. I, I tend to think that John was written down later, but I think it was written by an eyewitness. By later, I mean during his lifetime, but yeah. just that he was old. Um, but I think that the knowledge of Jesus having made these these I am statements, and also I and the Father are one, which technically is not an I am statement, but it's a statement of equality with God, was, uh, was known. Uh, the question of just how high the Christology of the synoptics is, is, is an open and interesting question. I myself don't accept all of the things that are used to indicate high Christology in Mark. To, to give one example, when Jesus is walking across the water and he says, don't be afraid, it is I. Now, you know, ego and me is there, but he may have been speaking Aramaic anyway. And besides, I think he was just trying to allay their fears. I don't think he was making a claim to deity. Coming out of the darkness and making a claim to be Yahweh isn't really going to make them feel much better. So I think he was actually just saying, hey, hey guys, it's, it's me, it's okay, rather than making a claim to deity. That would just be one example. So I tend to agree with you that we, we need John to have the strongest possible case we can that Jesus himself taught that he was God. This was not a later Pauline uh, imposition upon Jesus' character that, that Paul and the, and the uh, possibly disciples just kind of made up this idea that Jesus thought he was God. So I think we should bring in all of our ammunition there. I certainly wouldn't want to be discussing the question of whether the Bible and Jesus teach Jesus' deity with a Jehovah's Witness and have to uh, hamper or handicap myself by not using the Gospel of John. I think it, so that doesn't mean I don't think there's any high Christology in Mark, especially, for example, where Jesus claims to be able to forgive sins. Um, yeah. Or in Matthew, where he accepts, and this is one that my friend Jonathan McClatchy has convinced me of, he accepts uh, Psalm 8 out of the mouth of uh, babes, have you perfected praise because of your enemies when he's telling the uh, Jewish leaders he is not going to rebuke the children for praising him in the temple. That's got some pretty implicit high Christology there because it's it's God, it's Yahweh who is being praised in, in Psalm 8. So there there is implicit high Christology, but I definitely don't believe in that self-handicapping. Now, as far as um, 
multiple attestation. That's a very good question. I love multiple attestation. I'm a huge fan, uh, although I will take it back more often to the uh, persons, the witnesses, than to the documents. All right, so we have, you know, 11 disciples who saw Jesus and then James, his brother, and then apparently Matthias as well, since he was included in, uh, according to those criteria of having seen Jesus after his resurrection. So there's multiple attestation for you. Um, we have to be very careful about independence, though. I've done a lot of professional work on this, and I have an article in the New Testament journal Familias about um, the sometimes errors that are made there. For example, Paul's creed, as it's called, it's called a creed, in 1 Corinthians 15 was doubtless partly dependent on the apostles. And the apostles also stand behind the gospel narratives. So to call Paul's creed, where he attests that, say, you know, Jesus appeared to the 12, an independent attestation that Jesus appeared to the 12 is actually not correct because he was getting it from the same people who, who also said it in, in the Gospels. That fact is a summary that Paul gives there. He summarizes some facts. So we have to be careful. Um, the other thing is that, unfortunately, multiple attestation becomes a kind of a gold standard. And there's a mistaken idea that it, it's not objective. We don't have objective historical evidence unless we have a satisfaction of what are called the criteria of authenticity that were invented by the search for the historical Jesus. And people will say, um, we should try to have at least two of these. And th these are just rules of thumb. Uh, and they're, they're fine if you have them, but they're not the standard of objective historical information. One of the favorites is multiple attestation. Now, this tends to unfairly disfavor the Gospel of John because so much of the material in John is, is unique as far as those specific sayings, those specific stories, and so forth. And yet, at the same time, we find a, a dovetailing, and this is where I do... Um, many undesigned coincidences between things that John does say and things that the uh, other gospel authors will say in other places, even if it's not the same story. So an example of this would be that I believe the, the healing of Bartimaeus and his companion in Jericho that's told in the synoptics dovetails with um, John's story of the healing of the man born blind in the following way that these men in Jericho had heard of Jesus and had heard that he healed uh, the blind. And if you look at the synoptics, there are almost no miracles prior to that time that are recorded in that geographical area. And it's hard to, hard to believe this. And yet it, it's true. Here's this crowd following Jesus, thinking of him as a miracle worker. The men sitting by the side of the road think of him as a miracle worker. And they... Um, they call out to him, son of David, have mercy on us and, and restore our sight. How did they even think of that? Did it just filter down from Galilee? It makes more sense that they had heard of the healing of the man born blind in Jerusalem, which would have been much closer. That's recorded only in John. But that's not multiple attestation. It's what's great. I mean, it's a dovetailing between two completely different stories. So we need to think outside that box of the story only the criteria that are listed by what's called the criteriological approach or the criteria of authenticity. That reminds me very much of my rereading of John 14, where, of course, you have the witnesses you do not agree in regards to Jesus' statement, tear down this temple in three days, I will raise it up again. And this becomes a major part of the mark and description of the crucifixion, where even those at the foot of the cross, you know, mock mocked our Lord over that statement. And yet it appears nowhere in Mark. It only appears in John 2. So it just points to some of those undesigned coincidences, which, which you've, I think, become very expert in. Uh, another point, too, which is unique, with the independent material in John, I find we have exact place names, dates, times, geography, and yet the actual spoken words of Jesus are often um, counted off as merely Johannine community reflection. This leads me then to the question of Johannine authorship. Now, I remember tuning into the White Horse End podcast some time ago where they were interviewing yourself, uh, I think, 
uh, Richard Bauckham and several others over the question of the author. What I find remarkable, and this is one of my own moments of Eureka leading to an acceptance of the Gospels as a narrant and as reportage, is the overwhelming evidence for the authorship of the Gospel by John, the son of Zebedee. We have, of course, uh, the disciple of John Polycarp, and then we have Polycarp's disciple, Irenaeus, in the patristic record. And Irenaeus makes it very clear that John, at a very old age, at a ripe old age, presumably in Ephesus, is working on the gospel. But as we've discussed in our correspondence, many, such as Bauckham, tried to draw a wedge between John of Zebedee and the fourth gospel by claiming that there is another John in the mix because of a cent second century fragment by Papias. Um, I was wondering, just given our own discussions of the matter and given your own work on a, a new work on the Gospel of John, I was wondering if you could shed light on your understanding of the authorship and how this assists us in defending reportage. After all, if we are to claim that the author of the fourth gospel isn't necessarily apostolic, then we don't have firm ground necessarily to stand on or less firm ground. But if we know, and I think the patristic evidence overwhelmingly defends this, that John, the son of Zebedee, was not only the, um, the oral uh, author of this text, perhaps dictating to a scribe or scribes, then all of a sudden we can see how he's fitting material together as someone who had heard the I am statements and had heard the I and the Father and one statements in living memory. Right. Excellent and important point. And I want to be as fair as possible here to Richard Balcom. Uh, Richard Balcom's other John is himself the beloved disciple. So um, what I have done in my forthcoming book called The Eye of the Beholder, which I have recently sent to a uh, copy editor, is that I've divided out the idea that the author was the beloved disciple, where I agree with Balcom, and I discuss that in a chapter, chapter four, John the Beloved Disciple, and the idea that he was specifically the son of Zebedee, where I disagree with Balcom, and I put that into a very long appendix um, because there's so much interest in Balcom's theory. So to be as fair as possible, um, Balcom does hold that he was a witness, and particularly of the things that happened in Jerusalem, which is where uh, I and the Father are one, and before Abraham was I am, occur in the Gospel of John. On the other hand, something I, I have to deal with is that Balcom suggests that the author did not travel uh, with Jesus to Galilee, and that he would not have been an eyewitness of Jesus' Galilean ministry. And there I strongly disagree uh, with Balcom, and I even deal with that in the chapter, not just in the appendix. I, call, I ask whether John was a stay-at-home. Was he a, a stay-at-home, just a guy who hung out down in the Jerusalem region, which would at least drive somewhat of a wedge between him and the, uh, the Galilee portions of the, the gospel. Uh, the other thing is that there are others besides Richard Balcom who will take this question, uh, maybe, you know, he wasn't the son of Zebedee, and they'll just cast a complete fog over the authorship altogether. I've, I've seen uh, Craig Evans do this in a debate uh, Q&A. He's like, well, we don't really know, and, uh, you know, he, I'm sure he wasn't, uh, you know, the son of Zebedee, maybe, you know, a, a disciple stood somewhere behind it. So then you end up casting doubt entirely on the notion that he was a disciple, which is not a, not Balcom's intent, but it, it is a way that that can work, especially if one thinks that the uh, fathers, the church fathers did teach that he was the uh, the son of Zebedee. Then if you think he wasn't the son of Zebedee, you just think they're wrong. And so then you're going to end up just, you know, throwing them out. I wanted to make a comment about Papias because you were mentioning that something that's really important to emphasize, which I'm sure you know, and some of your viewers know, but it would be surprising to see how many people become confused on this. Papias never says that anybody other than the son of Zebedee wrote the Gospel of John. In fact, we have no extant writing that we can definitely identify by Papias in which he even addresses who wrote the Gospel of John. The, the fragment of Papias that is often used in these debates is simply where he's listing people that were um, sources for information about Jesus, uh, and he lists uh, John, clearly meaning the son of Zebedee, and then later in the same passage he says, uh, or the elder 
John and Aristion. He lists these two, and it's sometimes it's debated a lot whether he means two different people or whether those are supposed to be the same person. One way you could read it is that he means that these are two different people. At the most, that would establish the existence of another guy named John in Asia Minor who had been, um, you know, who was known as an elder and so forth. This doesn't tell us that he was the one who wrote the, the gospel, but you would be astonished. There is a book published by the Society for Biblical Literature that contains an essay by uh, Ben Witterington III in which uh, Dr. Witterington goes on at some length saying that Papias says that um, John the Elder, rather than John the son of Zebedee, wrote the gospel. And I mean, he repeats it. He says, you would think Papias would know who wrote the gospel and so on and so on. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he, and he, and he cites Richard Balcom, and he's just misunderstood, apparently, apparently misunderstood Richard Balcom, because Balcom is clear. Balcom, I mean, he thinks that this other John wrote it, but he doesn't try to claim that Papias explicitly says that in something we have. What Balcom does instead is this very elaborate and to my mind, highly unconvincing conjecture that that may have been what Papias said in a now lost work, which we do not have, which he thinks Eusebius suppressed. So, um, Papias doesn't say that. So um, I go into all of this at length. Balcom even attempts to reinterpret Irenaeus. So Irenaeus expressly says that John the Apostle wrote the gospel, but Balcom implies that Irenaeus used the word apostle so loosely that it could have been um, this other John. I think that's very unconvincing. So these are fascinating issues, and it's part of the reason for the length of my forthcoming book, but I definitely think that um, all of the clear patristic evidence we have points very explicitly to the son of Zebedee, uh, and even Balcom admits that from the third century onward, it is unanimous on that point. So that's why he has to kind of go through gymnastics to reinterpret the earlier evidence, uh, I think the patristic evidence is, is very strong and unequivocal that it was the son of Zebedee. And then, you know, this leads to the discussion of some of the fourth century authors who we've corresponded about who sometimes get dredged up in the debate whether John could have been martyred too early, let's say, in Jerusalem sometime in the 60s. Uh, people like George the Sinner or Philip of Side. Yet what's interesting about both works, which claim a martyrdom of John, uh, they claim that his martyrdom occurs when he's an old man, already having returned from Patmos to Ephesus during the reign of Emperor Trajan. And even then, I'm, that statement I'm making is heavily implied from fragments, which could easily be interpolated. After there's been a long-standing tradition for, I'm assuming, at least two or three centuries, that he is already passed on at a very old age. So either way you cut it, John seems to have been, if not the last surviving uh, eyewitness, at least the last surviving of the 12th to, to at least carry on that knowledge. This leads me then, of course, inevitably to ask, I think one of the arguments that we see in Bart Ehrman's uh, rather nasty correspondence at times is his use of the argument from silence. Mm. Uh, this is something I've come up against in apologetics debates in the past, and I thoroughly understand it. You know, it's a question that has, I think, nagged the hearts and minds of a lot of good people. You know, if Jesus makes these massive divine claims uh, that we see in the early creeds in the Pauline literature, why doesn't it appear explicitly in the Synoptic Gospels? In one of our correspondences, I think you brilliantly mentioned um, some of the errors in that form of thinking and how an argument from silence um, is not only highly improbable, but doesn't make sense in light of a living memory in which these events are actually being recorded and then being passed down with a succession of bishops. Right. Well, I think what we have to do is calibrate in history. Um, and this is something my husband has done a professional paper on and has taught me a lot about. We are often taken by surprise when we do history, when we see what people don't record. One of my favorite examples is the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant, which include no mention, uh, and, and they include no mention that uh, Abraham Lincoln signed the Declaration of uh, Emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, for the slaves, which would have been one of the biggest events in his lifetime. 
when Marco Polo talks about his journey to China, he never mentions the Great Wall of China. Uh, there are a number of other such examples where pre-theoretically or intuitively, we might say, surely that person would mention that. Something we need to recover is what I call the randomness of saliency. Saliency is what strikes you, what jumps out at you, what seems uh, important to mention, what comes to your mind. Uh, we, and particularly scholars, <coughs> have very little sense of the randomness of saliency. I sometimes think that policemen will have more of a sense of that, or uh, judges or lawyers who question witnesses regularly. That You will be surprised at what witnesses mention and what they don't. And so the other thing is we don't want to impose our own uh, apologetic concerns. So we go back and we assume that everybody back at the time when Matthew, Mark, and Luke was written, were, that they were most concerned to say, let's be sure to get all that stuff in there about the deity of Christ. You know, we got to be sure to give our strongest argument for it, our strongest case for it. Um, maybe that wasn't their priority. And it, it's kind of interesting that people who will talk quite a lot about the goals of the authors and their um, and not being an ast anachronistic and how they didn't have our same goals, they kind of need to apply that a little more widely to say, well, maybe, you know, maybe Mark did not sit down consciously with this goal in his mind. Uh, I want to be sure out of all the things that Peter mentions to uh, mention anything that can support the deity of Jesus. And Peter himself may not have said, you know, all the things that I t might tell to Mark, who's going to write down my memories, I want to be sure to mention everything that might uh, support the the deity of Jesus. They, they might have had instead more of a goal of telling about what he did or about his death on the cross as an atonement for our sins or about um, his being the Messiah or something like that. It's just often a matter of priorities. It's also important to remember that the selection of material among the synoptics is not entirely independent. Now, I do think there's factual independence. Sometimes they add things to one another. We definitely find that details will be added where we do have independent memories coming in. But the selection of which stories to tell, you know, from a list, there seems to be some degree of dependence among them that there was some kind of um, primary document. And of course, there are debates between Matthian versus Mark and authorship, uh, priority, excuse me, Mark and priority is, of course, the, uh, the most popular view today. But either way, they seem to have been willing to sort of follow along uh, to a, a fairly large extent as far as which, which stories they told. Whereas John, in my opinion, is in a sense negatively dependent on the synoptics in terms of what he chooses, and self-consciously so. That is to say, if they all tell something, I think John says, well, that they already did that. So I'm in most cases, except for the, the, the passion, of course, the resurrection and the feeding of the 5,000. But in most cases, I think John is like, you know, the parables have already been done to death. I want fresh material. Um, and similarly, if they haven't told something that John may be saying, oh, I want to be sure to include that. And that's what we call negative dependence in probability theory, that, you know, the more they tell something, it may be the less likely that John is to tell it and, and vice versa. I think he's self-consciously supplementing. So that's part of why John brings in the stuff that isn't there. Given the concept of su uh, supplementation, self-conscious supplementation, supplementation, we would actually expect to have uh, a lot of unique material in John, including that, that material about Jesus claiming his own deity more explicitly. And of course, you know, even aspects of the Galilean ministry, you mentioned, you know, is John a homebody? Well, clearly he's getting the information about the wedding at Cana somewhere. You know, we know that John, according to the tradition, is the caretaker of the Blessed Virgin in Ephesus. And what's unique for me is, if I look at the infancy narratives in the Gospel of Luke, what's interesting is Luke claims as a you know, companion of St. Paul to have interviewed eyewitnesses. Uh, did he potentially interview Mary and John in Ephesus before uh, you know, the close of the 50s or the 60s AD? I mean, Luke is there for three years. It, it just indicates to me that when we think of John I think the temptation of a lot of critical scholars is to say he is so late that the information would have been basically in dissidence. But that's not the case. You, you have an eyewitness author um, writing only 
you know, 60 years after the events described, even though the other apostles have passed on, have been martyred, what's very clear is that some of their acolytes have certainly not. Um, and this leads me then to really wonder, comparing this work to other works in, in the ancient world, I, I know that uh, your husband, Dr. Timmergrew, has mentioned a lot of work on Plutarch, and, and so have you in the past. How would you personally, as a scholar, uh, size up the eyewitness and near eyewitness evidence of the Johannine corpus with other works of ancient literature of the first century? Wow, that's an excellent, that's an excellent question. Um, well, one thing I would say right away is that I think John is very scrupulous. So, uh, for example, consider Josephus. Um, something that I talk about in The Mirror or the Mask is that a lie is not a literary device. Propaganda is not a literary device. We still have lies and propaganda today. So uh, Josephus, in my opinion, misrepresents at one point his own earlier um, his own earlier behavior. So in one of his works, he represents his reasons and his motives for um, being in Galilee and uh, training the people and so forth, uh, that he was training them to fight the Romans. And then later in a different work, he, he represents it that, uh, no, I was just there to keep the peace, which, uh, you know, to, to help, you know, the Romans to keep the peace, you know, it's obviously he, he's whitewashing his past career because he, Right. I don't think John ever did that. So even though obviously Josephus is an eyewitness of his own life, you know, that kind of goes without saying, uh, but John is a more scrupulous eyewitness. Um, and then also we, we certainly get differences in gaps of time. One of the things that I consider very eyebrow raising, and I talk about this in the mirror or the mask, um, there's an anthology out there uh, mostly written by the students, the doctoral students of Dr. Craig Keener. Then it has an essay by Dr. Lacona. It has essays by Keener himself. It was edited by uh, Dr. Keener and uh, one other person. It has an essay on the infancy narratives um, and compares them to Plutarch's life of, I believe it's Coriolanus. And now Coriolanus was centuries earlier and the author, who uh, at that time was one of Dr. Keener's graduate students, uh, accepts unquestioningly the theory of a classicist named D.A. Russell that um, Plutarch simply made up an incident in the childhood of Coriolanus. Uh, now, frankly, I think that's unjustified too. It's based on an argument from silence. I discussed this in the book. Uh, I think Plutarch might have just had another source. We just don't know what source that was for that particular story. But even if he made something up like that, you know, it's hundreds of years before. Whereas, as you say, um, with the infancy of Jesus, they could have talked to Mary. Um, possibly they could have talked to James, Jesus, kinsman, as a Catholic would say, or brother, as I would say, as a Protestant, um, who would himself have talked, you know, with Joseph before Joseph's death. I think Joseph was probably dead by the time of Jesus' ministry, so maybe none of the apostles actually met him. But Matthew's uh, story of the infancy really has a strong perspective of Joseph. And Luke's perspective of the infancy really has a strong perspective of um of mary and there's a lot of then there's complementarity and overlap and so forth between them so one way or another i think matthew is depending partly on joseph's memories but you know the idea that plutarch's life of coriolanus is at all comp uh, comparable is ridiculous and yet this this uh essay in the anthology ends by saying well luke was very the phrase he uses is uh literarily conscious, I believe is the phrase he uses, and because he was very literarily conscious, by which presumably he means Luke's Greek is very good, and he might have been, you know, trained and so forth in Greek uh, writing, then maybe Luke thought it was okay to make up stories about Jesus' infancy. That's a paraphrase, but that's what he's getting at. I think that's a terribly unjustified inference. So the Gospels compare extremely well, in my opinion, in to other writings of the time in their closeness with the facts and the scrupulousness of their authors. Also too, uh, as, as someone who does believe we're dealing with eyewitness reportage and inerrancy, if we do assume a composite narrative, which includes material from Matthew and Luke and material that perhaps is not recorded, um, we have 
an extraordinary event in the life of Mary and the life of Joseph. I see no reason why that data should not have been copied down in writing or in some solid form during you know, the earlier years of the life of Jesus. I, I, I see no reason why, just as family records are made now at a very early time and in, in, in a very early stance, why you can't have earlier written material that just is no longer extant. Uh, there was work done which uh, the Jesuit uh, Mitch Pacua, uh seemed to be discussing at one point that if one was to take, for example, the, the Canticle of Zacharias, the Benedictus, or if you were to take the Magnificat of Mary, and if you were to translate these into Aramaic, that you would have some sense of rhyming. I'm not a linguist. I don't know if that is or is not the case. What I do find it interesting, though, is that all this data seems to have been recorded before 70 AD. Luke omits a reference to the martyrdoms of Peter and Paul in the Book of Acts. That suggests to me that the work has to at least predate the 60s, perhaps even the 50s. And then that bumps up Luke quite early. The thing with John is because you have a, a post-70 AD date for redaction, it's unique. It's almost as though after 70 AD, after the other apostles have passed on, it seems as though a lot of my other you know, contemporaries, in terms of their thinking, assume that suddenly there is a vacuum and everything that we could have known about the life of Jesus is suddenly lost. However, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it Eusebius's quotation of Hegesippus that Jude, the kinsman or the brother of Jesus, depending on which ecclesiastical tradition, mm -hmm. um, that Jude's grandchildren were brought before, what was it, Emperor um, Diocletian? or uh, Emperor Trajan uh, for fear that they had some kind of messianic kingship or claim it. So you still have familial eyewitnesses to some degree that are still alive in 90 AD. They aren't completely all died out. Just because you, know, you have Peter and Paul who have been martyred um, and John is an elderly man, doesn't mean that let's say, just for the sake of an intellectual thought, Let's say that John did fabricate something. Um, there would have been a series of eyewitnesses to say, no, it didn't happen that way. In fact, we have records that suggest otherwise. Do you think that's a cogent argument for defending the, scrupulous, the scrupulosity of John? I think that that kind of checks and balance is, uh, is supported by Papias. Um, you remember I mentioned before that Papias names this guy named Aristion. Um, and, and we don't hear anything else about him anywhere else. But uh, Papias makes it pretty clear that there were other eyewitnesses of Jesus um, that were alive, you know, in his own lifetime um, that we may not even know of from the Gospels. So these could have been members of the 70 uh, who were Jesus' followers. Uh, of course, Paul says that Jesus appeared to 500 witnesses at once. Jesus had a much larger group of followers other than just, uh, you know, the 12 or even the, the ones who are actually named in, in the Gospels, uh, including women. So I think there would have been checks and balances of that kind. Um, I, I also think that we really get an insight into the mindset of the people and the way that they thought and what they were concerned to do. And it's interesting, my conclusions that I've come to with this are diametrically opposed to the conclusions of someone like the classicist turned New Testament scholar, Richard Burridge. Richard Burridge tries to say that the uh, negative connotation of fiction is modern. I could not disagree with him more strongly. Papias actually says something to the effect that he, he did not want the mere words of men, but that what he wanted was the, um, the information proceeding from Jesus himself. You know, he really wanted to know what Jesus himself had actually said. And so Papias has this enormous concern for eyewitness testimony. Um, and we find, of course, John himself in his gospel saying that he had, um, that 
he who saw it bear record. We know that his record is true and so forth. So this is, it's important to them that they, that they get it right. The fact that Jesus was important to them, you'll find that a skeptical scholar will assume, well, the fact that Jesus was important to them meant that they would have no scruples about making things up. I would draw exactly the opposite conclusion. I would say the fact that Jesus was important to them meant that they really wanted to know what Jesus really did and said, um, because otherwise they would be basing their uh, beliefs on a lie, very much like what Paul says, if Jesus isn't risen, then our faith is in vain. We find this reflected in an author uh, named Julius Africanus. Um, he's just a, a little bit later, who's talking about uh, the genealogies and the supposed contradictions and apparently someone at his time, we don't have this person, had suggested that the uh, authors Luke and Matthew may have made up some names and inserted them in the genealogies. And to make it to make it seem that Jesus was the king and prophet and priest and so forth. And Africanus is just livid. He says that, that this wouldn't bring any praise or glory to God. This would only bring, uh, this would only bring disgrace upon the person who, who does it. Um, I think we also have evidence for the, the high view of truth and scrupulousness from the, the widespread nature of harmonizing. So we find, uh, you know, Epiphanius harmonizing. We find St. Augustine harmonizing. We find Eusebius harmonizing. You know, we find all these guys attempting to harmonize and never saying, uh, oh, well, you know, it's just a literary device, uh, you know, at the time. That the, the nearest thing you get to that is Origen, who is an outlier, and even he doesn't refer to a literary device. He, sa he has his own very eccentric idea that these things took place on a spiritual plane, and we should do that instead of harmonizing. He appears to be alone in that, and he doesn't say that it's because it's a known literary device. It's just his idea. So I would take an even more robust approach, even more than saying, well, at the time John was written, there were people who would have corrected him. I think that may be true. But even if you say, well, maybe none of those happened to be, you know, in Ephesus where he was writing it or something like that, there's all this other evidence of the view of truth and the high view of truth that they took. And I get into all of that in the Mirror of the Mask. I love the analogy that you made on, I think it was uh, with Jonathan McLaughlin about the, the redheaded stepchild metaphor. Uh, John being basically, he appears to be the one witness who just sticks out like a sore thumb in the minds of a lot of critics. However, for me, if I look at a lot of the Pauline statements about light in darkness, the authority and deity and preeminence of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the transcendence of Christ, that that all sounds quite Joni to me, and therefore, you know, I, I found your analogy to Redhead Stepchild to be quite actually illuminative. I was wondering if you could actually recapitulate that for some of the viewers. Right. Well, that's the name of my first chapter in uh, the, the forthcoming book is John, the Redheaded Stepchild of Gospel Scholarship. So, you know, the Redheaded Stepchild is, you know, people in, uh, adopt a child, but he looks way, very different from their other children. And maybe people look at that askance a little bit. Um, and the idea is that gospel scholars just, John is different, John is different, John is different. It's this incessant drumbeat you'll hear. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's said so vaguely that it's like mist. You, you can't get a hold of it. You can't decide, okay, exactly what are you saying that John did or changed, you know? So you'll have a reference to Johannine idiom. Exactly what does that mean? And I try to drill down on that in the book and, and talk about a range of things, some of which could be, you know, John maybe happened to insert a couple extra times when Jesus said, amen, amen, instead of just saying one amen, you know, <laughs> or um, that, you know, maybe John uses the phrase, uh, you know, witnesses, the term witnesses, is a favorite term of his. Maybe Jesus said, I came to uh, tell about the truth and Jesus and John uses the phrase, I came to bear witness of the truth, which is, you know, completely recognizable paraphrase because that's one of John's favorite words or something. The, these very moderate idiomatic changes that could be taking place, which could be taking place on the synoptic side as well. That doesn't make John any different from the synoptics. Um, all the way over to uh, John inventing whole sayings based upon 
what he thinks Jesus would have said or what he thinks was Jesus theological teaching or something like that. Those are, that's this entire, you know, range. So what I think we have to do when someone, even someone very conservative, even when we, someone we actually do trust says, well, you know, John is just different or he translates what Jesus says into his own idiom is to say, you know, let's, let's just drill down on, can you, what exactly do you mean by that? And another thing that we can, do if the person has written an entire work maybe the example he's going to give is something that's going to be extremely minor whereas then in in, in what he's written it's there's something more uh stronger you know stronger stated so uh an example here would be kingdom of heaven now this is not john this is in the synoptics kingdom of heaven versus kingdom of god that some in some of the same scenes, you have kingdom of heaven and in the you have kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, Dr. Keener thinks that that may have been a variation of paraphrase. That's very moderate paraphrase. That's no big deal. But when you go to Dr. Craig Keener's commentary on the Gospel of John, and he's talking about John 12, and uh, Jesus says, um, what is it? Uh, what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this hour, I was born into the world. Father, glorify thy name. So he's, he's kind of musing aloud about the forthcoming crucifixion. And Dr. Keener says that John transplanted that. He moved it from the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, what does that mean, that John moved that from the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, it means John, that Jesus didn't really say it, as it occurred in John 12. At least that's the only way I can read that. But in an interview, that's not necessarily what we brought up. So when we look at John, we have to recognize the similarities, and then we have to recognize that the differences uh, have an, all manner of very uh, innocent explanations that have nothing to do with um, nothing to do with John's making things up that Jesus didn't say, or even systematically making replacements. I have a whole chapter called The High Resolution Jesus. And one of the things I do there is that I just go through, you know, similarities in the way Jesus talks to the way he talks in the synoptics. It's actually very surprising. Thank you for the High Resolution, resolution Jesus thesis. That really actually is incredibly heartwarming because I, I think, as you pointed in another interview, why shouldn't we assume that Jesus used different uh, terminology or different uh, forms of, of thought? And, and why can't we assume that there is more, perhaps, synoptic parallels in the voice of the Master in the, the fourth gospel? Everybody says how they're different. And yet, you and I are both aware of, you know, the Johannine thunderbolt after Jesus in Matthew 12 has declared himself Lord of the Sabbath incredibly high Christology stuff. And then conversely, in John 12, he uses agricultural metaphors, unless a green grain of wheat falls and dies. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think you mentioned this earlier too, um, the whole uh, parallelistic structures of he who receives you set, uh, receives me. Mm -hmm. He who receives me uh, receives him who sent me. All scattered throughout the gospel of John. That sounds very synoptic like. So why, why can't we say that Jesus didn't always say, amen, amen, I say to you, before every single statement? Why can't we just say we have multiple, um, a, a highly uh, resoluted portrait of very different forms of speech that this one um, historical figure used from a historical point of view? I mean, after all, the way I'm speaking to you now in a very academic train of thought is not necessarily how I sound if I'm on my way to the movies or if I'm commenting over a meal, or if I'm speaking with, for example, um, you know, an opponent in a, a, a friendly debate. It, it's a very different stylistic tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I, I make a point about, that's very relevant to what you just said, about uh, statistical representativeness and this problematic statistical assumption that you find. Um, which is this assumption that each gospel has a little footnote that says the way that Jesus talks in this gospel is statistically representative of the way that he talked all the time. There is no such footnote 
<laughs> no gospel has such a such a claim or makes such a claim for itself. Now, once we get rid of that assumption that every gospel separately is statistically representative of quote the way Jesus talks, whole vistas you know open up to us that of 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 understanding them to be historical, and then we can stop saying, well, Jesus talks differently here than he talks there. Well, maybe John was just more interested in certain themes, and so he picked. Uh, more of places where Jesus talked about certain themes uh, than others. And so it's astonishing how this implicit claim of statistical representativeness that is not actually justified uh, is, is informing this evaluation that John is uh, not historically accurate. There's also tremendous evidence for his historical accuracy in the things that he doesn't do. So this is, uh, I'm getting this from Leon Morris, the late Leon Morris. Morris notes that uh, when Jesus is before Pilate, Pilate is uh, afraid and he, and he comes and he says, uh, where do you come from? Because of course the the people have said that he claimed to be the son of God and he's committed blasphemy. And Pilate as a Roman is very, you know, freaked out by that. He's superstitious because the Romans did believe that there were uh, sons of gods and so forth. And so he doesn't want to bring bad luck on himself. So he goes and he says to Jesus, where are you from? Where do you come from? And Jesus, it's this perfect opportunity. It's almost like Pilate is saying, hey, please launch into a little discourse on you know, you're being the son of God and how you came from heaven and how you came down from heaven, all these very yawning themes. There is no son of God discourse before Pilate. There is no, I came down from heaven to do the will of my father. All of that stuff appears elsewhere in John, even though Pilate appears to invite it. This is evidence that John did not make those things up, that he's just recording them when they actually happened, because even when there's a perfect opportunity, he doesn't insert one. Yeah, and another point too about Pilate, it's interesting that in 1 Timothy, I'm assuming it's composed somewhere in the 60s or late 50s AD, uh, Paul makes reference to a good confession made before Pontius Pilate. Mm. Uh, and yet that good confession only appears in John 18. Uh, it, it, a part of your undesigned coincidence is Jesus says in uh, Luke 24, oh, I am a king. Which basically from a Roman mind, if he means a king in a political sense, Jesus essentially has just admitted, oh, yes, I'm a, I'm a revolutionary. And yet Pilate turns around to the Pharisees and says, oh, I find no fault in him, which implies, therefore, in that undesigned coincidence, that John 18 dialogue about I have come to testify to the truth, all who hear the truth hear my voice, has to then have been heard, and it has to have been recorded to a degree. Also, I think everybody assumes who takes a very um, low Christ Christological view, a highly critical view, that all these events uh, to quote Paul later, humorously occurred in a corner, but they didn't occur in a corner, as, as Paul makes reference in front of King Agrippa. I, have it, I, I find it hard to believe that there was no other attestation during the, the trial sequence at all. And I, I know we have very, very um, fictitious documents, presumably in the second and third century, claiming to come from Pilate. We, most scholars, I'm sure, uh, are very dismissive of those, but the fact that some report may have been sent back or some report may have been preserved seems somewhat plausible to me, given the fact that, you know, Matthew at least records a high percentage of the population in Jerusalem coming to see the events unfolding of the crucifixion of Christ. Well, a lot of times scholars will say that the conversation with Pilate was private, and it, that only Jesus and Pilate were present. It's worth noting that none of the Gospels actually say that. Uh, John says that John says that uh, the rulers, the religious leaders, did not enter for fear of ceremonial defilement. That doesn't mean that nobody else was was there. Certainly, you know, it would have been a smaller group. It wasn't in front of the mob. It makes it clear that Pilate is going back and forth. But there could have been uh, guards present. Pilate might have allowed some of Jesus' followers. To be present and we know that the beloved disciple was present later at the foot of the cross so he would have tried to be as close to uh, Jesus as he was allowed to be he might have been present uh, kind of 
slightly far-fetched conjecture, perhaps even Jesus' mother was allowed to be present. Um, Pilate was not really trying to conceal what he was doing. In fact, I think he just wanted to get out of the whole thing. I think he would have rather that, that the whole problem just went away. So, um, it, and apparently he would have allowed the religious leaders themselves to be present, but they chose not to because of the ceremonial defilement issue. So um, I think it's pretty clear from the very fact that we have undesigned coincidences that there was more than one person present who later reported these things to the Christians because that's how you get most often undesigned coincidences is that you have more than one witness and then they tell parts of it. They tell different parts of it. Um, so we don't necessarily know who it was, but we definitely should resist the proposition that you'll hear people saying as if it's just a established fact that, that Pilate and Jesus were alone. I don't think that's true. Yeah, particularly when you have at the end, uh, think of Mark 14, uh, Pilate marveling that Jesus is already dead and then calling the centurion who is at the scene Presumably, perhaps, I know it's highly conjectural, maybe even the centurion who uh, pierced Jesus' side in John 19, to come back and report what occurred. It's, it's basically a, a throwaway statement, and yet clearly there is a concern that everything has gone um, according to plan. What's unique is, once again, John's including a lot of incidental details as well. You mentioned these ceremonial uncleanness versus cleanness. Uh, the fact that he says that um, Caiaphas was high priest that year, referring, of course, to the fact that you had this rotating door of high priests under that current period of time. Um, the fact that um, you have Malchus's name being referenced, whose ear was you know, forcefully removed and presumably healed, according to the Luca narrative. Um, those coincidental details don't point to this immediate res or in, in, to a kind of um, fictionalization of the events. The, the tone to quote J.R.R. Tolkien has this serious tone of history to it. And, and while I can't say that uh, Tolkien was making a systematic argument there to Lewis, I, I think it bears note that if I'm reading the Gospel of John and I open up to Jesus' statement, uh, before Abraham was, I am, you are dealing with a discourse, and I think you've mentioned this before, which doesn't sound like Greek drama. It does not sound like uh, basically one of the platonic discourses of Socrates where everything is evenly, evenly balanced. I was wondering if you could lay that out, how a lot of the Johannine discourses, uh, if we can call them discourses rather than dialogues, they appear to get away from themselves. They don't actually appear to follow this linear line of logic as most people are thinking. There are points where, for example, in John 8, when Jesus says, unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins, they ask, who are you? Maybe they picked up on that I am nod, but overall, it sounds more like eyewitness reportage. A tape recorder was on, and people began to uh, definitely talk off course, given uh, the scope of the discussion. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, for example, things will get named like uh, the light of the world discourse, you know, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But immediately what they say to him is you are testifying of yourself. Your testimony is not true. Literally what follows that argument, it, it's called the light of the world discourse, which is really a dialogue. It's not about his being the light of the world. I mean, the, the topic never even comes back up. Um, or if you think of his dialogue with the woman at the well, um, she's, she changes the subject, you know. He starts by talking about living water and so forth, and he says, uh, go call your husband. And so then they get on to, you know, her lifestyle. And uh, she says, I, I have no husband. And he says, you say rightly, and you've had five, and the man you're with right now is not your husband. And she says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then, you know, she, she starts telling him, uh, oh, you know, where should we worship? So, you know, I have a theological question. Um, and, and one does find that these things happen when people are embarrassed. They'll say, hey, I have a question. And they go off onto another topic. And Jesus follows her. You know, he doesn't say, no, 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 no. I want to get back to talking about the living water. You know, he, he just goes into um, discussing that God is a spirit and the time will come when neither at Gerizim nor at uh, Jerusalem will men worship God. That, of course, is an allusion, I believe, to the destruction of both Jerusalem and Gerizim, which I think Jesus foresaw prophetically. Um, 
but that God is a spirit, they, they who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then she says, well, uh, when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. And he says, I who speak to you am he. So it's this very natural movement um, in there. And, and then in some of the discourses, it's even a little embarrassing. They, refer, they call Jesus a demon-possessed Samaritan, and he calls them liars and the children of Satan and so forth. So um, I just don't find this to be a controlled, uh, highly thematic discourse or even highly thematic dialogue. And I certainly don't find that it resembles the allegorical figure of Lady Wisdom, which was something that Craig Evans said. You know, it's amazing. Nobody ever calls Lady Wisdom a demon-possessed Samaritan. It just <laughs> never happens, you know? Um, all these things, they, it, you know, they never say, oh, we know this person's father and mother, and who does he think he is, or who does she think she is, and so forth. It's very grounded. John very grounded in history and it's very odd that dr evans will say well in these passages he sounds like lady wisdom in these passages uh it he looks like an allegorical character that it's it's just false i mean there's there's no other way to put it there's no more tactful way to put it i suppose this is what would be called my bad tone but to just say there's the scholarly statement and it's just a, it's just incorrect it's just inaccurate jesus doesn't look like lady wisdom in those places well, and, and first of all, why should we expect him to care like Lady Wisdom? I think the only reason why people push the, the wisdom Christology is the wisdom of God, the power of God, referenced in one of the, the Pauline epistles. And maybe Jesus' statement, uh, wisdom is approved by her children later on in the synoptics. But otherwise, I, you know, I, I remember I was taking a course in Second Temple of Judaism recently. And um, what was remarkable is we were going over Philo's commentary on the creation in Genesis, where, you know, he mentions the Logos as a hypostasis, God from God, life from life, true God from true God. But what's unique for me is at no point in the discussion then was it stated, therefore, Logos theology was actually in the air in the first century. Ergo, there is no reason why John couldn't have, as a 90-year-old man, spoken about uh, Jesus as the Logos. Um, and, and for for me, I find it remarkable how patronizing, um, unintentionally, um, or sometimes perhaps intentionally, some, and I believe the name's anonymous, of the scholarly field can be towards John, the son of Zebedee. They say that this man um, is this illiterate fisherman. We don't know he was illiterate. There were hired hands inside the boat, for crying out loud. It clearly, he could have had servants for uh, transactional information. Also, maybe he learned a thing or two uh, trying to be the, the pastor, bishop of uh, a congregation in Ephesus and being the last surviving apostle. Those are some extraordinary life situations. It also leads me to wonder, too, about the discussion of Lady Wisdom. I think... For me, if I look at Jesus' statements, and correct me if I'm wrong, apart from the come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, I think at the end of Matthew 11, for me, I, I don't see that many uh, parallels. Is it just that people are looking for Jesus, Jesus as the hypostasis in the text? Um, or is it the fact that people are trying to make John merely, in the, I think, in the words of my dark double ganger here, you know, Craig Evans, like kind of like a, a parable and loosely using that term parable. I think that uh, it, it probably arose to some extent from an attempt to find a Jewish source for the wisdom language uh, or the logos language or that concept in John as opposed to a Greek source. So some people may have even seen it as a way of defending John. So that instead of saying that John is heavily Hellenistic, we can say, oh, well, now we realize that, you know, um, all this, this stuff about wisdom and, and also the connection with the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Essenes as well, that this material had its, its roots in Judaism. And then some people might even think of this as a kind of a, a defense of, of John as being authentically Jewish rather than heavily Hellenized. Um, it's, it's interesting how sometimes people think that certain things are defending the historicity of the Gospels and then the directions that it goes in doesn't really defend the historicity of the Gospels. Um, so Ben Witterington's commentary, uh, it, I believe it's called uh, John's Wisdom, if I recall correctly. And so he does a lot with the, the 
alleged parallels. And he doesn't say, it's a little unclear, and it's some of that unclarity that I sometimes find frustrating in uh, New Testament scholarship. So you're saying, Jesus, you know, did he say it or didn't he? Please, please just speak plainly on this subject. Uh, but I would, I would certainly say, uh, in defense of Dr. Witterington, he certainly doesn't say that Jesus didn't really say these things. Um, so, but he'll allude to the parallels that he, that he thinks he finds, I think sometimes he's uh, overcalling the blow, maybe even pretty frequently saying he finds parallels to the language of uh, Lady Wisdom in Proverbs and Sirach and so forth, um, that uh, he, he says it's the evangelist. So he doesn't say that it's Jesus. So sometimes if there were parallels, it might just have been Jesus. It's just, with all my gratitude, I really am grateful for all your observations, Dr. McGrew, mostly oh, because I, I've been begging for a lot of these answers for a long time, and you're one of the only scholars who's really been raising any of these points. Yep. So I'll just wrap up real quickly. I was going to say, if there is an allusion to the wisdom literature, to me, the strongest one is probably when Jesus says, um, that he that eats of what I will give him will never hunger, uh, and he that drinks will never thirst. Lady Wisdom says, if you eat of me, you will hunger for more. If you drink of me, you will thirst for more. So Jesus may be alluding to that, but that could just be Jesus himself. I'm sure he was familiar with Lady Wisdom saying that, saying that he was greater still than she is. So that certainly need not mean anything ah historical in what Jesus is recorded as saying in John. Brilliant. Well, I think just concluding on the note, is there any final thoughts you'd want to add, uh, Professor McGrew, about your upcoming book, The Eye of the Beholder, and any of your latest research right now on just New Testament studies and perhaps a, just positively, you know, the contribution which your work is making so that we can have more confidence that when we hold the eyewitness reports of the New Testament, we are dealing with history and not merely with uh, what the world calls mythology. Well, what I would say is I want to encourage uh, both Christians and non-Christians and seekers to realize that when we Christians say that the Gospels are historical, very strongly historical, we don't have to take this on blind faith. We don't have to have two epistemologies, one for uh, our scholarly work and another for our devotion or our Christian belief. We can have a unified mind. Uh, the objective standards of scholarship go beyond what a, a given set of scholars might permit at any given time. And so therefore, we can know that these are historical by uh, examination and not question begging examination, not by coming in and, and bringing a load of uh, our own theological assumptions, but rather by just looking at the evidence. It may take a long time. So have patience, be willing to read. And The Mirror of the Mask is a big book and I, I don't want people to be intimidated by that, but be willing to read, be willing to dig in deeply and study, and I think you will find your faith to be strengthened by the knowledge that our faith is founded on facts. Yes, it's, it's the historicity of the incarnation that honestly brought me into deeper communion with the authority of scripture, and then the authority of, of the eyewitnesses that helped build up uh, a possibility of getting to know Jesus. As you said, I think in the introduction to the mirror and the mask, our faith is built largely on the person of Jesus. If we only have four conglomerate ideas about him, then it's very difficult to build a relationship with the Lord. So I just found your work to be incredibly um, assisting in my own devotional life and my own historical life as I've been dealing with a lot of higher criticism, a lot of the disciples of, um, of airmen and trying to sort of pull a Justin Martyr in my own work. So thank you for your continued research, Dr. McGrew. Thank you for having me, John. It's been a great pleasure.